Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello everyone, my name is Ghazi Abd Razak. I am a fifth year medical student and today I'll be teaching you about uh, a lecture which was given by Dr. Hanna, um, which is called Protein Folding and Diseases. Okay, now um, here are my contact information. If you guys feel that you have any questions, please do not hesitate, hesitate to reach out to me either through my, my phone number or uh, my email. Okay, so the the... The lecture, the objectives here will be talking about, first of all, I made a quick recap about uh, the protein structure, which is, I feel that it's important for, yani, it's important for you guys to understand it before digging deep into uh, uh, the concept of denaturation. Okay, so we'll start with a quick recap, then um, we'll talk about the the specific objectives of this lecture, which is protein denaturation, the role of chaperones, uh, uh, protein mutations and misfolding and the protein misfolding and diseases as a conclusion. So we'll be concluding with some diseases that are related related to protein misfolding and denaturation. Okay, <laughs> so we'll be starting with the, as you guys see this illustration. So this is the uh, amino acid. An amino acid is composed of the um, an amino group, a side chain, and a carboxyl group. And uh, more than one amino acid connecting to each other will form a polypeptide chain. And more than one polypeptide chain connecting with each other and folding with each other to each other, it will. Uh, this is called uh, a protein. Okay. Now, so a polypeptide chain again, as a, as I said, that it, it's composed of uh, more than one amino acid, and these amino acids are connected to each other by um, peptide bonds. Okay. Right. Now. Uh, let's get started with different types of protein. It's like a sequence from the primary structure of a protein to the quaternary structure of a protein. Okay. Now, a primary structure is a group of amino acids that are connected to each other and to, to form a polypeptide chain. Uh, this polypeptide chain is presented in a linear fashion. Okay, so in a linear fashion, let's read here. So it's a sequence of amino acids in a linear chain, which is made up of one polypeptide chain or more than one polypeptide chain, but they are connected to, uh, to other and they are presented and can be seen in a linear fashion, as we can see over here. Okay, so this is called the polypeptide, uh, sorry, primary, primary structure of a protein. Now, this primary structure of protein, we need, it's a, it's a an important thing to note that it's it is stabilized by the peptide bonds between the different amino acids now going into the second structure and the second structure there is a little bit of folding okay now in the second structure um it's uh, uh, this little bit of folding of the polypeptide chain will bring about a new uh, 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 structure which is called alpha helix or beta sheets so if the secondary structure is or can be seen in um, in a spiral fashion, it will be called uh, alpha helix. If it can be seen in this fashion, as we can uh, see it over here, it's beta pleated. It's called beta pleated sheet. I mentioned something that in the primary structure, it, they are stabilized by a peptide bond, right? Here, there's an introduction of a new bond, which is which will form the backbone of the alpha and beta pleated sheets. Uh, the alpha helix and beta pleated sheets, it is called the hydrogen bonding, okay? So the, here we have the hydrogen bonding. It's very important for the stabilization of the secondary structure. So a primary structure, which is a linear, with a little bit of folding, will form a beta pleated sheet or will form an alpha helix, which is called a secondary structure. Now, this, a little, this little bit of folding will proceed to form a 3D structure, and it's called the tertiary structure. Now, the tertiary structure, um, now we have more bonds introduced into this type of structure. In the secondary structure, we have the hydrogen bonding plus the peptide bonds. Here we have the peptide bonds, okay, which connects each amino acid to each other, the, like uh, every amino acid to each other. And we have the R side uh, uh, chains. The R groups has different interactions with each other. Now, this amino acid over here will, in, will interact with this amino acid over here and by hydrogen bond. This amino acid over here will interact with this amino acid uh, over here by, for example, hydrophobic interactions or hydrophilic interactions or ionic bonding, etc. 
okay? This interaction with different amino acids from different locations of the chain will lead to the tertiary structure and a specific type of folding depending on this bonding. You guys get me? So we have the polypeptide chain with or one more than one polypeptide or one, one polypeptide chain connecting with each other, each amino acid next yani each amino acid with the next amino acid it's uh, connected by a peptide bond however this amino acid will be connected to a different very different amino acid with different location with different type of bonding and this is determined by the r uh, uh, or by the r side chain now what interactions we may have in this uh, structure, we might have uh, hydrophilic interactions, hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic, ionic, and disulfide. Tamam? Right. Um, okay. Going into the quaternary structure, and the quaternary structure is, let's say, if this is a one polypeptide chain, the quaternary structure will take this polypeptide chain and will have it as a subunit, uh, and four subunits, four subunits will form the quaternary structure. So four subunits connecting with each other will form the uh, uh, um, quaternary structure. So this level or this structure involves the assembly of multiple polypeptide chains or subunits. This is a subunit, okay, into a single functional unit. Now, these four subunits are connecting with each other into a single functional unit. They will perform one function because it's now called a protein, right? Now, what important structure that we know, we know it in our body and it's composed of a quaternary structure, uh, it's hemoglobin and hemoglobin is very important for the unloading and loading of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs right and uh, in the peripheral tissues um yeah so a primary structure will proceed to secondary structure with with a little bit of folding then secondary to tertiary structure with which will form a 3d shape with different uh, uh what's it called uh, side chains and then to quaternary uh, uh, structure. Now, we have the protein folded with each other due to the R side chains. Let's say that there is something from the extra, from the environment or any stressors that uh, um, that that that's introduced to the to the, to the cellular environment. Okay, this stressor will lead to uh, the breaking of these bonds. The breaking of these bonds. Now, as I said, that these bonds are important for the. They are they are important for the folding. If these bonds starts to break, okay, this will lead to a little bit of, of misfolding, and this will bring about the diseases that I'll be talking about by the end of this lecture. You guys get me? Yeah. And um, this is mainly it, I think. And here's the um, a quick recap on the uh, a, a table a table talking about the stuff that the different structures of proteins, uh, the primary with a linear sequence, the secondary with the hydrogen bonding, and we here we have different R groups in the tertiary, and the quaternary structures, different subunits uh, clogging with each other, okay? Uh, um, such as the hemoglobin. Right. Okay, so here is the text. Protein folding happens due to the R side chain, okay? And it's a non-random process, okay? The R side chain will determine how this protein will be folded or how this protein, the way it's fold. You, you guys get me? So it's a non-random process. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a specified process due to the R side chains. Um, now, as the protein folds, secondary structures form and tertiary structure form. And uh, a fully folded protein is now functional, which is such as in the, the quaternary structure, it's functional now, such as the hemoglobin. We know its specific function, such as uh, a protein that's, for example, in the cell membrane, we know that its function in, it, it's used for the, for the transport of substances or molecules from the inside of the cell to outside or from outside to inside, etc. okay? So he, uh, this is the, the general concept be, behind folding. Now, okay, how does folding happen in our body? Okay, so when a normal uh, protein, we, when we have a, a protein that's unfolded, sorry, unfolded, and it's being produced and this is still unfolded, it will go to an environment that will make it, like as, uh, an environment that will make the folding suitable, okay? So this unfolded protein, protein will, will go into something in a regulatory protein in our cells. It's called chaperone. This chaperone is different. It has different subtypes of regulatory proteins that are important for the folding process of uh, the, the unfolded proteins. 
Okay, so this is an IE an IE protein going. Um, it's it's unfolded in the in the uh, what's it called in the cytoplasm. It will go to a pro a regulatory protein called chaperon. This chaperon will help this protein to get folded, and it will secrete it to uh, uh it will it will secrete it to outside, and now it can um perform its physiological functions. Right, so. Um, a chaperone are proteins that assist in the proper folding of other proteins. So it's a regulatory protein assist in folding of other proteins and uh, maintain their functional 3D structures. Now, what do they do? They prevent the newly synthesized or partially folded proteins from aggregating. Now, here we will introduce a new concept called aggregation. Now, here we have a folded protein. If this folded protein, now, subhanAllah, our, uh, in our body, uh, this uh, process is very like it's very regulated. Like if we have a hydrophobic interactions of the proteins, these hydrophobic interactions will be inside between the amino acids will be inside, and the hydrophilic interactions will be outside. This will make the protein soluble, and it can uh, stay in the solution. However, if this hydrophobic proteins or interactions are happening outside of the outer surface, this will lead to unwanted. Uh, um, un un unwanted uh, like uh, diseases or abnormalities, right? Um, so if we have any misfolding of the proteins uh, presenting these, uh, what's it called? Pre presenting these, um, uh, pre presenting these hydrophobic interactions to the outside, okay? This will lead to protein aggregation. So it will aggregate and precipitate in the solution. Aggregation and pre precipitation of proteins in the solution will lead to uh, um, uh, tissue damage and cellular damage. Okay? Okay. Let's read the text again. So the chaperones are important because they prevent newly synthesized or partially folded proteins from aggregating and help guide them toward their correct uh, 3D conformation. We'll be touching upon the, the aggregating um, uh, concept, inshallah, in the next couple of slides. Now, chaperones, as I said, it has sub- uh, subdivisions, okay? So we have something called chaperonins or heat shock protein 70 and others. Um, they differ, the, the expression of the chaperone has subdivisions. Uh, if, for example, the environment is, uh, uh, there's a st stressors coming on to the environment of the cells, there might be upregulation of the HSP, which is heat shock protein, which can adapt to high uh, uh, temperatures. Tamam, or to uh, to periods of ischemia or hypoxia uh, uh, in the cell. Tamam. Now, heat shock proteins um, is a subdivision or subtype of chaperone uh, that are there. One second. So, and that are there under the conditions of stress, there will be overexpression and upregulation of heat shock protein, which is upregulated to protect the cells from various kinds of. Uh, damage. So we can see it over here. If we have any stressors, okay, there will be upregulation of a regulatory protein, a chaperone called heat shock protein, and this heat shock protein will take this denatured protein uh, or misfolded protein and repair it, okay, and repair it. And um, uh, I mentioned that chaperones are important because it will make the environment suitable for uh, folding, the folding of the proteins and the repair of the misfolded proteins. Okay, now HSP70 helps helps newly synthesized proteins fold correctly and refolds the misfolded proteins for the repair, I mean, and it prevents from aggregating and causing cellular damage. The maintain, this maintain, uh, maintain their proper structure and function, which is vital for cell survival uh, uh, and uh, cell survival chaperone activity, uh, which, which is important under stress conditions, okay? So this is the picture from your slides. Um, I guess from your slides, yeah, regarding the heat shock protein. And now going into the concept of denaturation, let me repeat the concept uh, again. We have a fully folded protein, a fully functional protein. Let's say um, there is a, there's a time comes where this protein starts to uh, uh, misfold or denaturate. Why does that happen? Due to certain uh, uh, cellular 
uh, uh, conditions, uh, certain stressors that are introduced to the cell, such as ischemia, decrease in oxygen supply to the cell, uh, such as high temperature. So, for example, in fever, where we have our body, it's the the, the temperature of our body shifted from 36.8 to more than 37.6 to 38 to 39. Here, proteins will start to um, they are they are not stable now because the what what happens exactly in denaturation is that the bones will start to break. Tamam? The bones will start to break. And breaking of the bones that maintain this folding process, breaking of the bones will lead to denaturation and misfolding. So now it's folded when the bones are, are starting to break, there will be a misfolding type of thing. And this misfolding will lead to aggregation. Okay, so high temperature, uh, uh, breaking of the bones, uh, breaking of the bones will lead to uh, misfolding, misfolding will lead to yani, denaturation, misfolding, this will lead to um, protein aggregation, and this protein aggregation will be deposited in the cells and will lead to ex uh, cellular damage and cellular death uh, ultimately. Okay, let's read the text. Uh, the example I mentioned, this is a normal protein and uh, under um, Lost, uh, yani under certain environmental conditions, it will denature, and denature the protein will appear like this. Uh, it's not plugged with each other, and it's exposed to the extracellular environment. Let's say there is a, a hydrophobic interaction, or hydrophobic interaction which was inside, okay, which was not introduced to the outer uh, uh, surface. Now it's introduced to the outer surface, and will make the the protein insoluble, insoluble protein, yani. Um, uh, uh, insoluble protein and the de deposit of this protein and uh, sorry aggregation and precipitation of this protein in the solution. But now denaturation is the unfolding and disruption of the secondary and tertiary structures. But there's a thing here that it's written that without the hydrolysis of peptide bonds, I mentioned that we have different bonds. We have the R side chain and the peptide bonds, right? Now let's keep in mind that. Out of all bonds, the peptide bond can withstand peptide bond can withstand stressors can with can withstand high temperatures. Okay. However, however, the other bonds they they will break easily. Okay, they will break due to any uh, uh, stressor. This will bring us to know that we have out of the four structure which structure is stabilized purely by the peptide bonds. It's a bond is the primary structure. Okay, so in periods of denaturation, the protein will, will be denatured from the quaternary to tertiary to secondary to primary. And primary will, will stay there because it has the, the peptide bond and this peptide bond won't be break. It, it won't get, uh, sorry, broken by the, uh, uh, by the stressor, right? So I hope you guys understand uh, understood this concept. There might be a disruption of hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and sometimes dust sulfide bridges causes the protein to lose its integrity. Now, denaturing agents, I said, for example, high temperatures such as high fever. We have acids such as hydrochloric acid, um, some solvents, some detergents, some toxins from outside. Uh, yeah. And, uh, okay, once the protein is denatured, this is irreversible. So it cannot got like folded again okay so this is irreversible so once the protein is denatured this is an irreversible process uh, so denaturation of proteins usually uh, um, uh, will lead to precipitation and aggregation Tamam. Okay. now there's a, a concept called the melting temperature of proteins now the melting temperature is the temperature that is needed to break 50 percent or to make 50 percent of the protein unfolded Okay, so this is what melting temperature uh, is. So te melting temperature is a temperature which 50% of the protein is unfolded, and it's typically from 40 to 60 Celsius. Our temperature, the human body temperature is, the, the inside temperature I mean, is 37, um, 36.8 to 37.3. Um, now, if it's more than 37, if it's from 40 to 60, proteins will start to, uh, um, will start to, it, it will it's like will irritate the proteins and will start the, the denaturation process of the uh, proteins. Now, here in Dr. Hannah's slide, she mentioned that there's something called TAC DNA polymerase. And TAC DNA polymerase is a protein, is an exception. It's not a 
uh, a protein inside the human body. It's a protein that's being produced by a bacteria called a heat loving bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. So Thermus aquaticus is a bacteria that produce uh, uh, TAC DNA polymerase. Now, researchers take this TAC DNA polymerase and use it in the polymerase chain reaction, which is a, 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 a molecular technique that's that, that's used to amplify DNA, okay? And that's used for different research purposes and experiment experimental purposes, okay? Now, they take the, this um, protein or enzyme from the this bacteria and introduce it to the PC to PCR because PCR needs yani it operates uh, under high very high temperature okay a temperature from ninety to 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 hundred and this protein can withstand this uh, high temperature because it lives only in this temperature tamam um, so this is the the concept behind behind the thermus aquaticus the, uh, the very nice factor that's produced by thermus aquaticus which is the TAC DNA polymerase. Okay, yeah, but in our human body, I don't think that there is a protein that can withstand a uh, temperature more than 40 degrees or 40 to 45 degrees. Okay, yeah. Now, this is a slide talking about different protein function. You guys took it in uh, multiple times in your biology and your uh, in the previous lectures, right? So, protein. Uh, um, uh, it's there for transport, for structural uh, maintaining of structure, for enzymes, and for other purposes. Okay, now let's say that we have a protein that's uh, denatured and it's abnormal. Now we have a defense mechanism in our cells, uh, which is, which is regulated by a regulatory protein called you called ubiquitin. Okay, so ubiquitin it's like a sensor it will identify that there is a protein that's denatured like this protein, okay? And it will tag this protein, okay? It will tag this protein. It will build up on this protein and will tag it. Now, this protein, it's, it's like a signal, right? So we have a protein with a signal here. Now, this will be sensed by the proteasome, which is an enzyme that will take this ubiquitin um, denatured protein complex, take it, inside the enzyme, inside the proteasome, and it will be degraded into different fragments and will be secreted uh, uh, as a waste, tamam? So this is the mechanism or the cell, the defense mechanism in our uh, cell against denatured protein. So a protein that's denatured, that's misfolded, that's um, ready to be degraded, it will be tagged by the ubiquitin, ubiquitin, misfolded protein complex will be taken up by the proteasome and this proteasome will degrade this protein and will will split it up into fragments and these fragments or peptides as as we can see here and these peptides will be secreted uh, uh, as a waste and these uh, peptides uh, are not um, like w w won't damage our um, our body or our cell, uh, cells and tissues okay so misfolded proteins will be tagged and degraded and um, uh, now uh, they are they are say, saying here that in and in, as individual, yani as we age, okay, proteins will start to get misfolded more, and uh, this system cannot keep up with this increase in misfolding of the protein. So that's why we have a lot of proteins that are plugged in our uh, misfolded proteins that are plugged with aging. Okay, with aging. Um, yeah. So protein misfolding, why does protein misfolding happen? Uh, we said that due to stressors such as uh, uh, high temperature, such as uh, different environmental from the outside environmental factors, such as metals, pesticides, inhaling of toxins, um, due to different stressors, and stresses, or stressors inside, inside our body, such as um, increase, a decrease in oxygen, hypoxia and ischemia, or due to DNA mutation, which might happen due to radiation, for example, radiation therapy can uh, uh, can can lead to DNA breaks, and DNA breaks will lead to DNA mutation, right? And DNA mutation will lead to introduction of new amino acids, new genes that are uh, will that are not normally there, right? Uh, um, and that's why will lead to uh, misfolding of the protein. Now, protein aggregations. I discussed the hydrophobic interactions, which are insides when the protein denature uh, denatures or um, they start to 
start to be misfold, yani start the misfolding process, it will lead to these hydrophobic interactions to be uh, exposed to the outer environment. Exposing of these to the outer environment will lead to precipitation of these because they are insoluble. Uh, uh, precipitate precipitation of these in uh, the solution and aggregation and will be deposited in different cells leading to diseases that will be discussed in a bit. So hydrophobic amino acids tend to exclude from the aqueous surface um, of proteins. Exposure of hydrophobic due to improper folding could lead to aggregation and aggregates are, are highly stable. Once aggregated proteins are too large, they become insoluble and fall out of the, uh, uh, fall out of the solution, <coughs> meaning that they will uh, precipitate, okay? Okay, so here we have different diseases that are related to protein misfolding. So we have neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. Um, we also have diabetes, prion disease. One, two, three, four will be discussed, inshallah, in the next couple of slides. And these happens, or these happen due to the uh, protein misfolding and ultimately aggregation. Okay, starting with disease number one, cystic fibrosis. Now, you guys can see a gray text over here. It's just for more comprehension. I brought it from different resources. Uh, so you guys have an idea on what's happening in this disease and you have a better understanding, but it, it wasn't mentioned by Dr. Uh, Hanam. Now, in cystic fibrosis, there's a gene or there's a receptor called cystic fibrosis transmembrane conduct conductance regulator, okay? This, uh, uh, this uh, transporter is highly expressed in pancreas, in the lungs, in the nasal cavity. Yani in areas which produce, uh, areas which produce mucus, tamam? What's the main function of sifter, okay? It's there to hydrate the mucus. Okay, so here we have structures, it has the chloride uh, channel, which uh, excretes chloride to outside, which will help to hydrate the uh, mucus. Now, if we have this, the sifter channel mutated, uh, uh, ab abnormally mutated, this will lead to the mucus being produced, but it's not the it's not hydrated, okay? So if the mucus is not hydrated, will lead to plug of the mucus and plug of the mucus will lead to obstruction, right? Obstruction in the airways, obstruction in the nasal cavity uh, will lead to pancreatic insufficiency. So pancreas won't be able to secrete their enzymes which are important for the digestion, uh, uh, digestion of the, the macronutrients and the micronutrients, right? So let's read very quickly. So we have the sifter. This sifter is being mutated at position 508, which, which removes the uh, uh, which is mutated at the phenylalanine amino acid in the in the position 508 of the gene. Okay, so we'll delete a three nucleotide in the sifter gene will lead to loss of this phenylalanine at this position, uh, um, uh, thereby abnormality of the the receptor. So sifter is a chloride channel that helps regulate the movement of chloride ions out of the cells. This function is, is crucial in maintaining the proper balance of salt and water on the cell surfaces, particularly in the mucus producing cells in the lungs, pancreas, and other organs, okay? Thereby mucus will build up and it will plug uh, um, and will, there will be an obstruction of the airways, obstruction of the, in the nasal cavity due, due to mucus or in the pancreas. Okay, now we have another disease called sickle cell disease. And in sickle cell disease, it's a disease of the RBCs. Uh, we know that we have an a, a alpha globin gene or alpha globin and beta globin subunits. Now in the beta globin gene, the beta subunits, there will be a mutation. And this mutation will lead to uh, a substitution of valine for glutamic acid. And glutamic acid now will be produced or will be exposed in the environment, but it's insoluble, right? Uh, and will have an insoluble interactions, a hydrophobic interactions. Uh, so under low oxygen conditions, tamam, in hypoxia, for example, this hydrophobic interaction or patches on hemoglobin S, tamam, when we have the glutamic acid being produced in beta globin, this, uh, the subunit now is, is called hemoglobin S. So there will be interactions between hemoglobin A and alpha and, and, uh, and hemoglobin S, okay? 
Now hemoglobin S molecules will stick together and will polymerize and will precipitate in the solution. تمام? And uh, so the, the formation of these fibers forces the red blood cell to become stiff and adopt to a sickle cell. Now, when it's a precipitate, يعني when, this, uh, with the, the, when there's abnormal in the beta globin gene, uh, there will be, it will produce a rigid fibers and these rigid fibers will form the crescent shape of the, uh, of the cell that, can, where that we can see it over here. تمام? So fibers of abnormal hemoglobin will deform red, red blood cell into the sickle uh, shape due to the polymerization, due to the aggregation of the uh, uh, proteins um, that will form this uh, abnormal shape that can obstruct also uh, some vessels in our body. تمام? I hope that makes sense. So substitution valine for glutamic acid in the beta globin gene, and in this beta globin gene, this will lead uh, this will lead to um, uh, abnormal exposure of the hydrophobic uh, or hydrophobic interactions, and these hydrophobic interactions uh, will lead to aggregation, aggregation thereby uh, uh, polymerization and uh, precipitation of the solution, and um, and uh, formation of abnormal the this abnormal uh, uh, this abnormal phenomena, which is the sickle cell disease. تمام the sickle cells, which will lead to sickle cell disease. طبعا. Okay, so we talked about cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. Now we have Huntington disease. This is a neurodegenerative disease um, that, that there will be, um, what's it called? Degeneration of the GABAergic receptors. And GABAergic receptors are receptors in our brain that are important for muscle coordination. تمام? So if we have, if we have an, a degeneration of these uh, uh, receptors, cells that produce these receptors, I mean, this will lead to abnormal muscle coordination and unwanted movements in our body. تمام? Inshallah, I will be taking this in, in your neuro block in uh, second year. Um, so it's a neurodegenerative genetic disease that affects muscle coordination. And since it's a neurodegenerative disease, this will lead, since it's happening in our brain and our brain as are being like eaten by um, by this neurodegenerative uh, disease, this will lead to cognitive decline Abnormal, uh, maybe um, loss of or abnormal uh, or altered level of consciousness, cognitive decline, and dementia, which is an acute confusion. تمام? Okay, so there's a polyglutamine repeat in Huntington. طبعاً, this is a protein, pro this problem ha happens in Huntington protein, uh, leading to uh, uh, a pro protein that's folded abnormally, um, thereby aggregation and neuronal cell death. Okay, طيب. now next disease after Hunt Huntington, we have amyloid, uh, um, uh, amyloid diseases and amyloid diseases, amyloid is, um, it's like a, a protein, a, a denatured protein that's produced by plugging or aggregating of a lot of proteins will pr produce amyloid, okay? And this amyloid can be deposited in different uh, organs in our body, such as in the heart and the neurons as well, تمام? So accumulation of aggregating proteins, which are called amyloids, okay, in different uh, parts in our body, such as in organs such as heart, kidneys, liver, spleen, nervous system. And uh, this will lead to uh, uh, a disease, طبعا, the, the, a disease that happens like depending on where this amyloid is being deposited, okay? So it's if it's in the heart, it will lead to cardiac amylo amyloidosis. If it's in the brain, it will lead to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, etc. okay? طيب. We'll be talking about amyloid in the in Alzheimer's disease, inshallah. So let's start with Alzheimer's disease. This Alzheimer's disease, we I mentioned in the, the previous slide, it's due to the amyloid amyloid plaques. What's amyloid? I will explain it in a bit. So it's it's due to two pathogen, patho, different pathogenesis. Depo first of all, deposition of amyloid plaques extracellularly and deposition of uh, neurofibrillary tangles intracellularly. Okay, fine. This is Alzheimer's disease. What happens in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease? طبعاً, the first important risk factor is aging. As we age, we have more misfolded proteins. Uh, as we have more misfolded proteins, we have more aggregation of the proteins and precipitation. So, yeah. Now, this is intracellularly, and here we have extracellularly, and we have a transmembrane protein called amyloid precursor protein. Under certain conditions, different stressors, 
there will be an abnormal enzymatic cleavage okay of the amyloid protein precursor leading to like a cleavage uh, in this uh, location will lead to uh, this protein to uh, to like flow in the in the uh, extracellularly right and this protein if it's it's if it's now flowing extracellularly it will lead to uh, different uh, manifestations because it will deposit in different um, areas in the brain. Let's say this is happening in the brain. But, so this is a protein that's uh, when, when it's it's cleaved and it's only one, تمام? it's called amyloid beta, uh, uh, amyloid beta peptides. So this is amyloid beta peptides. Different amyloid beta peptides will, will uh, group together and will form more than one or a lot of beta pleated sheets, okay? And now it's being called amyloid plaques. So amyloid beta uh, peptides will plug with each other and will form amyloid plaques. And these amyloid plaques are beta pleated sheets, which is the second, remember the secondary structure? So it will form a structure similar to the secondary structure, which is the beta pleated sheets in the secondary structure, tamam? After the aggregation of the amyloid beta peptides, they plug together and form amyloid uh, plaques. So this is an amyloid plaque. Okay, an amyloid plaque, we can see it over here. So this is an amyloid plaque that are deposited outside. So this is cleaved here. It will be produced to the extracellular uh, uh, matrix, not intracellularly. Tamam? Right. And this will lead طبعاً, to neurotoxicity, uh, um, which will disrupt cell-to-cell -cell communication, inflammation, and contributes to neuronal cell death. But I hope the concept is clear. So it's extracellularly, plugging with each other will form amyloid plaque. تمام. An amyloid plaque will precipitate and will bring about different problems in our uh, brain. Okay. Uh, طبعا, there's a thing that I forgot to mention. In, uh, the enzymatic cleavage is mainly happening by uh, two enzymes, uh, isoenzymes, the beta secretase and the gamma secretase. تمام. So abnorm they will be abnormally uh, mutated and activated. Activation of these enzymes will cleave the, this protein. تمام. طيب. Beside the extracellularly thing that's happening over here, which is the amyloid plaque deposition, we have an intracellular deposition by the tau protein. تمام? Tau protein is normally there uh, to stabilize to stabilize the microtubules inside the neuronal cells. So you guys know from your biology that microtubules are important because they maintain the structure of the cell. They help in transport and other stuff. صح? So its main its main job uh, that, that it's there to maintain the structure of the, the cell. Now, tau is there to stabilize those uh, microtubules, those microtubules which are inside the neuronal cell. Now, and under certain conditions, tau will be hyperphosphorylated, hyperphosphorylated. Okay, and will get will be or, or get, will get detached from the the microtubules and deposited inside inside the cell. Sorry, and deposited inside the cell. Okay, and aggregates inside the cell, forming something called neurofibrillary tangles. Neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, so tau protein microtubules normally they are bound to each other. Tau protein is very important for the stabilization of the, those microtubules. Certain conditions, stressors comes, uh, come. This will lead to the detachment of tau protein. Tau protein is now detached. It will, de it, it will aggregate inside the cell, forming something called neurofibrillary uh, uh, tangles. So in Alzheimer's disease, we have two things. We have the neurofibrillary tangles, which are intracellularly causing neuronal cell damage and uh, decrease in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And we have the amyloid beta plaques, which are extracellularly uh, uh, which which go to 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 the to different like to the brain, sorry, it's in the brain, but it it's uh, it it's there extracellularly, so it will form some problems that are related to uh, uh, in a tissue uh, level, uh, while the neurofibrillary tangles happens inside the uh, inside the cell and amyloid extracellularly outside the cell. تمام? I hope that makes sense. طبعاً, this will lead to brain atrophy and degeneration and stuff. Okay, so these are the two problems that happens in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Now going into a new disease, and a th the, our third neurodegenerative disease, which is the Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, there is a structure 
that's uh, called uh, alpha synuclein, which is a regu regulatory protein that's normally, normally, <coughs> that's are normally in the um, in a, in the dopamine rich cells. So dopamine is a hormone that's produced by uh, by the brain, and it's very important for different metabolical uh, function in our body. Tamam. So in in cells that are rich in dopamine, we have alpha synuclein there for stabilization and. Yani the same concept, right? If this alpha synuclein protein uh, get like uh, is uh, like get denatured and is now misfolded, this will lead to deposition and precipitation, <coughs> and will um, will lead to Lewy body's deposition, Lewy body deposition inside the uh, neuronal cell. Okay, so. In Parkinson's, we have the alpha. So uh, before here, <coughs> sorry, one second. So in, in uh, alpha synu, uh, so alpha synuclein is a protein which is abundant in dopamine producing nerve cells. It's concentrated in the brain. While smaller amounts are found in the heart, muscle, and other tissues. In Parkinson's, this alpha synuclein misfolds, aggregates, forming something called Lewy bodies, and this will disrupt the dopamine rich cells from signaling, <coughs> from producing of dopamine, uh, which will lead to de uh, degeneration of these cells and decrease in dopamine production, which will lead to muscle, uh, um, uh, muscle problems, because our brain, of, co of course, coordinate and uh, control our muscles so this will lead to uh, uh, tremors of the uh, tremors of the muscle and different uh, other manifestations okay now for cardiac amyloidosis again same problem um, same concept which is transthyretin uh, which is a protein that's being misfolded and being deposited in our heart if it's cardiac and this will lead to a restrictive cardiomyopathy, a problem of the heart that makes it restrictive and cannot like pump a high um, uh, volume of blood, for example. Tamam. And uh, again, it might be age-related or it might be due to hereditary problems. So no need to focus on this. But know, know that transthyretin is the, the protein that's misfolded in cardiac amyloidosis. And it's an amyloid protein, by the way, yeah. Okay, now we have our last disease for the day, which is prion disease. And in prion disease, it has different names, as you guys can see over here. So it has different names. And the main problem in prion disease, a prion disease is a problem, at, again, at genetical level, uh, but, uh, but it's an infectious problem. But it's not caused, caused by a microorganism. It's caused by... Uh, uh, an irrita irritation of the genes due to, for example, th there are a lot of causes, مثلا, um, exposure to cadavers, for example, this is one of the causes, um, uh, environment, uh, exposure to, to uh, bovine or cows that are, um, that, that has, that, that have this disease, for example, and other, uh, um, like, uh, transmission routes. So, in prion disease, there's a normal, our, our normal protein here is called PRPC, okay, which is normally present in mammalian brains and, and on the surface of neurons. In the CJD, which is uh, Kritzfeld uh, Jacob disease, which happens in human due to prion disease, yani, uh, this normal PRCP, PRPC, sorry, refolds itself into abnormal PRPSC, okay? Now, an, infec an infectious abnormal protein, which is called this, tamam, interacts with an infectious, which is this. So this with this interaction will lead to misfolding again and uh, altering the 3D conformation and changing uh, 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 into abnormal prion. And abnormal prion will lead to uh, degeneration of the brain. Tamam? Yeah. So this is, uh, the, these are the diseases that, are that were discussed by Dr. Hanna. This is the table that some like this is a table that summarizes all the diseases that we discussed today. So cystic fibrosis normally uh, due to sifter gene mutation at, at five hundred eight at position five hundred eight, which which is loss of the phenyl aniline alanine sorry leading to decrease of chloride conductance to the outside uh, and uh, a mucus which is not uh, hydrated. Okay, and this will lead to chronic cough 
lung infections and difficulty breathing and other, depending on the tissue that's being involved uh, or the organ. Now in sickle cell disease due to hemog beta hemoglobin gene will lead to formation of hemoglobin S and uh, this will precipitate in the RBC leading to a sickle shaped RBC and this sickle shaped RBC will will block the um, some vessels leading to uh, uh, different manifestations based on the the vessels that are uh, that or the, the organs that are perfused by the the vessels that are plugged by this uh, by the sickle cell disease okay now Third, we have Alzheimer's disease. But the main uh, symptoms for sickle cell uh, disease is pain, uh, joint pain and anemia. تمام? Now, in Alzheimer's disease, we have the amyloid beta plaques as well as the tau, the neurofibrillary tangles, um, extracellular and intracellular deposition, and Parkinson's disease, alpha synuclein and dopamine rich will lead to neurodegeneration, decrease in dopamine uh, producing cells, and cardiac amyloidosis, transthyretin. And the cardiac tissue and the prion disease, the PRC, uh, PRPSC. Okay. But now, this is the summary uh, of everything um, from the different types of proteins primary, going to secondary, going to tertiary, going to quaternary, with different bonding over here. And if there is altered, uh, altered folding, you lead to amyloid proteins leading to Alzheimer's, maybe Park, uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, other diseases and uh, prions uh, as we said such as ckd disease and yeah you can go over it uh, on your own and i prepared some questions uh, for you guys we'll go over it very quickly so which type of bones is primarily responsible for stabilizing the secondary structure of proteins it's um the the hydrogen bond as i said the, the top primary is biopeptide and the tertiary we have a lot of other bonds tamam now, what role do chaperone proteins play in folding of newly synthesized polypeptides? polypeptides? Um, think for five seconds, pause the video if you want. And the answer here is B, okay, because they provide an environment for uh, uh, folding of the proteins, preventing aggregation and misfolding of uh, proteins. Now, which of the following reactions would be least likely to stabilize the quaternary structure of a protein composed of multiple polypeptide uh, 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 polypeptide chains least likely to, to stabilize is the peptide ones, right? The peptide. Well, however, the the main st stabilization happens by the R side chain, which is ionic hydrogen and hydrophobic, and hydrophilic and other stuff. Taman, a patient diagnosed with Parkinson's disease presents with a resting tremor and bradykinesia, which are symptoms for Parkinson's. Um, which molecular alteration is most responsible for pathophysiology of this condition? It is the aggregation of alpha synuclein, in uh, which is uh, which is now called after it aggregates called Lewy bodies. In a patient with Alzheimer's disease undergoing cognitive assessment, researchers studying the disease uh, have found that accumulation of amyloid beta is a key feature. What is the primary source of amyloid beta in the brain? It's being cleaved by secretases, right, to the extracellular uh, space. Now, a 70-year-old uh, man is diagnosed with dementia after his family reports significant memory loss and changes in personality. Although he exhibits some motor problems, which of the following is more appropriate description of histopathological picture? So there's a problem with memory loss, so it's 70 year and he Alzheimer's disease, most probably. And this picture is pathognomic for neurofibrillary tangles, which happens due to hyperphosphorylation of a protein. What's the name of the protein? It's tau protein. So hyperphosphorylation of tau protein leading to aggregation and formation of neurofibrillary tangles, which are intracellular uh, uh, deposits. Tamam? So this was my last question. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you guys benefited from this uh, lecture. Please, please don't hesitate hesitate to reach out to me in case you have any questions. Um, I'll be inshallah there to help. Thank you so much for uh, attending and um, best of luck with your uh, mole midterm, mole TBL midterm and final. And have a good day. Assalamu alaikum.